paint from photographs for the most part. I find it uh, works well for students. And also I tend toward realism. Um, it's something that beginners can understand. Uh, they can tell whether it's right or wrong. I think that there are a lot of uh, techniques to learn and you need to learn the rules before you know how to break them. And I think it is difficult to paint loosely in watercolors when you first start. It's hard to really understand what works, what doesn't work, what looks good. Um, so learning from, from real life and from nature is probably the best way you can start. I use um, a color photo and a black and white photo. And the black and white is your instant value study. Um, I believe that we have a lot of technology tools and we should use them. So before I start, I make a photograph. Um, this particular one was a rosebud and that was one of several hours of shooting of uh, probably 50 different roses and 50 different combinations with different light sources and and I shot for hours in my kitchen and I kept looking at this thing and and they were nice shots and the light was okay and I went out and bought tungsten bulbs and everything else that you would think you need for true color and I was getting ready to, to pack up and all of a sudden the sun came through really low through this side window and hit this rosebud and I went that's it <laughs> So I can tell when I see something that I, that I want to paint it or not. Um, this rosebud actually is this color everywhere, but the way the light hits it, it bleaches out the color, but it gives it great shape, great dimension, great texture, and, and that's what we want to learn how to do. So we'll paint this rosebud today. The black and white copy, um, many artists will start and they tell you to paint a, or to draw a value study. Um, a small, maybe a thumbnail, and you put in your darks and your lights. I really just want to paint. So I make a black and white copy. I have my darkest darks, my lightest lights. I can see the values. It's hard for a lot of beginners to see values with the color. It gets in the way. So they look at this and they see pink and then they see brighter pink or darker pink, but they can't really tell values. Um, if you take workshops, and you should, um, every teacher brings something new to the table. Um, they bring their own opinion for the most part and what works for them, but you can always learn something. Um, I took a week-long workshop from uh, Susanna Spann in, in Florida, and this was years ago, and the one thing that I have always used that, that I learned in her workshop is the value scale. I think that value often is, is even more important than color. So, that's what makes these round. Um, it gives them the, the fullness they deserve, the, uh, the light source, it gives it the, the wow factor. And so if everything was done on this and very beautiful pale pastel, you'd finish and you'd have a pretty painting, but it would be sort of boring. So you can make these on your own, just a strip of watercolor paper. Take a quarter, make 10 circles, number them, Put your name on the back because people do steal these. And get Payne's Gray, which is a almost a non-color, very dull. But you want 10 to be your darkest dark, and you're going to add a little bit of water to your mixture as you come down this value scale. One is white. So this is excellent for looking at this and seeing if your values in your painting are where they should be. So you can put this Right here, let's say you think that's kind of a mid-tone, when actually four is not enough, or five, and you come, it's actually a 10. This is also a great tool to turn over and use the back. It helps you isolate colors. So you might look at this and think these greens are all the same shade, but you've got a yellow green. By removing all of the, the confusing factors or all the other color, it allows you to see what you're looking at on its own. So you know that that's a very dark, dark green, a little bit lighter, and then lighter still as you get out to the ends, very yellow. Um, 
We are greatly affected by the things that are around other things. We don't perceive them as what they truly are. So to isolate those colors, excellent tool. I think you should work with a limited palette as well. And in this case, we're just going to go ahead and, and get down to it. Before you start to paint, or even to get your image on the paper, if you can draw, have at it. If you can't draw, take your black and white copy and then just trace it, transfer your pattern onto the paper. It's hard to paint well when you don't have a good basis to paint. <laughs> Before you start to paint, you need to wet your paints, especially if you've already put them in the wells and they, they're dry. So in this case, we're going to use permanent alizarin crimson. We're going to use cobalt blue at the very end and new gamboge. But for now, just the permanent alizarin crimson. You need to pay attention to the names of colors. They vary quite a bit and Alizarin Crimson and Permanent Alizarin Crimson are different paints. They're actually different colors as well. So when your teacher says get one, make sure you get the right one. Just ask my students. <laughs> the wrong one. Well, good. I'm starting with the wrong color in the beginning. You need to make a nice, juicy, rich puddle to paint from. Um, a lot of people start and they come over here and they get a little bit on the tip of their brush and they, they rub it on the palette and then they have this nice faded out looking little blob. So when it's time to paint, they put it on and it's very pastel and they come back and they put a little bit more and go, okay, I'll put just a little bit more. Well, that didn't do it. I'll put some more, a little bit more. And by the time they get through, they've rubbed a hole in their paper. So you need good, rich, puddles. And by pre-wetting it, that's going to assure you that you will have those. Um, unlike a lot of people, I use two brushes. Um, I find it's easier to control and after all, we don't have much control these days, so anytime we can get some, it's a good thing. <laughs> This is one of those uh, slinging paints across your, your table. If you spill some on your paper, don't worry about it. Uh, the best thing you can do to begin with is very gently just touch it. Don't touch it in the same spot because you'll put that paint you picked up from here over here and then you'll end up with dots everywhere. So, forewarned is forearmed. I often turn it around and paint upside down. I think that it uh, lets you see things for what they are, for the shapes, for the values. In this case, we're going to start right here where the pink is in the darkest section and then blend out from there. The size of the brush really isn't that important. It's the uh, brush itself and whether it has a good point on it. If it doesn't, you can always lay it down and flatten it out, turn it over, and do the same, and you get a nice chiseled edge if what you're trying to get into is a nice tiny little area or a point. So first thing I do is to put down a wet blob. <laughs> That's a technical term for blob. I use the second brush with water. Always touch it to your paper towel before you come over here. And I'm going to lay this down. I've, I've got colored water just so you can see where I am. But I'm laying down this field of moisture and I'm putting this brush on the paper and I don't pick it up very often. So I go up and I catch that edge and then I pull it back out. Your strokes should follow the form. So in this case, I'm trying to follow that shape. 